All right, so I'm going to do a, a, a public and, uh, announcement here. Susan Cohen is our feature of the evening. And I'm going to say a few things about her. Usually my introductions are very short, very brief, and, and uh, they go over the top of complementariness of this. this is. So um, the first thing I was going to say is she is a wonderful poet. You think, okay, that's a sentence I've heard that said before. But think of the word wonderful. It means full of wonder. <laughs> And there are wonders in what she writes and the way she approaches the pen and the expression of thought and considerations. There's depth, sometimes in very short pieces you go, that was only 20 words, I'm transformed. So the thing is like, there's precision, intricacy, there is a full heart and, and, a, and, a, and a nice, wonderful, warm consciousness. And so, rather than have me go on, I mean, she, ha she you, you have brought some books, yes? So she has books that she has bring for, for your consideration, so that's really going to be wonderful. We got, bring up Susan Cohen here, with a nice, I love the room that I I want to be called, like I said. I'm going to make sure this is set exactly for you, because, you know, I don't think about the mic, I'm just getting it kind of close to it, so that you'll carry in. And, um... All right, and that is too much like it, yes. Oh yeah, thank you, David. Try that. Okay. Are you are you in the union? All that's right. Perfect. Great. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dan. I think that's the best introduction ever. <laughs> I'm really happy to be here, and thank you so much for inviting me. You're welcome. So, uh, and I've enjoyed hearing all your words. So, fellow writers, how many people know the word? Oh, thank you. Scytherism. Wow. P S I T H U R I S M. I didn't know it either. How do you enunciate that again? Well, I don't know if I'm saying it right. Scytherism. Wow. Uh, but when I when I came across it, I knew there was a poem in it. Uh. Um, and this is an educational poem. A dictionary names the wind in the trees. Scytherism. Because what else would we call sound embedded with leaf mold and breath zithering just below the daily drone of power saws and chippers, eons of air shifting like an old Chevy through leaves, riffling papery cornfields and the eucalyptus, stuttering through windbreaks, jittering an aspen in a beam of breath, Lisping, nothing pins me down in the language of the Huron and Hittite and Sanskrit, chittering all its unpronounceable names, its tunes with the shiver of pine needles and the moves of a river. Scytherism comes as close to the clash of wind and trees as orgasm comes to the friction of muscles, nerves, bodies, which is to say, when so many words cannot catch it, those of us always searching for just the right one may as well stop speaking and lift our heads like mule deer, ears twitched for the smallest sound. Mm -hmm. yeah. Ah, it's going up. It's a church. Okay. So this is a, 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 like Dan, I'm sometimes moved to write poems about poems. Um, I'm going to read a few poems from my book. Uh, this came out last summer, A Different Wakeful Animal, and then I'm going to read a few newer ones. Why whales are poems. They see things their own way. I imagine they have philosophies and some are arrogant but they can do little harm without opposable thumbs. As long as whales are, the story is larger than us, too big for prose. Useless to ask a whale what it means. It's shapely and precise, but we will never translate it. Their bodies, undivided, tempt barnacles and other flagrant scribblers. Because whales break the water open, shift ocean and sky, sing their adumbrated songs, carry their own light and shade, because they amplify. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
So there are a lot of uh, poems about the natural world in, in the book, especially the first section. Um, and I don't have a project or anything, but looking at these poems, I realize a lot of them revolve around concerns about um, what perishes and what might persist. And the second part um, moves a little closer to my personal life, including three poems written to parts of my body that aren't exactly body parts. So breath, fingerprints, and shadow. And I'm, I'm still waiting for somebody to give me one more idea. I always ask um, because I'd love to write more of these. It's kind of a way of thinking about um, what makes yourself where you are, where yourself is, um, and having some fun with it at the same time. Earwax and toe jam. All right, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> right. Somebody say, write those down for me, please. Uh, I was going to say footprint. I was trying to be like poetic. The ones that you can't tell me. All right. <laughs> Somebody said gender. Yeah, there's a thought. Um, so I'm going to read one of them to my breath. I held you underwater once just long enough. I lost you running. A baseball sucked you out of me. A car slammed my flat chest to the pavement. You deserve endearments. Essence closest to my heart, native offering. Slapped into being, bellowed from my lungs. How you do carry my tune. I taste you as the ginger in the clove of me. You are where I meet the universe, coming and going. Beloved atoms from all that ever breathed, Mastodon, Cleopatra, Poison Ivy, you let me make you my familiar. Baying dog of mine, buzz of the hot hide in my breast, my sweet parakeet, I let you escape. You keep coming back. <laughs> I don't know if any of you remember, but a few years ago there was a daredevil who who had himself flown up to the edge of uh, space, oh, yeah. um, jumped, jumped out. out in a special yeah. suit, and mm -hmm. all in order to uh, uh, with a parachute, all in order to break the free fall record, which which he did. Um, although I think it's been broken again since he fell 24 miles, he yeah, fell 24 miles, okay. and. Um, passed out at one point, came to. And, um, you know, I wondered, um, first of all, uh, what could have been just, you know, flying through his head? And then, uh, and then I wondered, why? <laughs> so this is called free fall. Free fall. He, free fall. He had time as he dropped to celebrate himself as a feather falling at the same rate as rock, as a windfall of apples, canvas carved into sail, master mariner, first man, atom of the stratosphere, Icarus come back to report from the sun's proximity, to think God must see me now that I'm a cinder in his eye. Time to remember and therefore to regret, worthless, what if, son of a bitch. Time entering the atmosphere with minutes yet to picture himself on the ground, legs whole under him, buckled, white knuckled. A long time trying not to listen for the chuckle of his blood if it began to boil. Silence as he calculated terminal velocity and counted and counted and counted on gravitational pull, the one sure thing any of us will ever know, and wished he had prepared a prayer with airtight snaps. Time, how much more, as his shoulders ached to feel that first jerk of shoot, falling, failing, fallible, nightfall, landfall, merciful, a lifetime as the planet, then the country, then New Mexico rushed up to ask him why he didn't find the ordinary plunge from birth to death, terrifying <laughs> enough. <laughs> So the third 
third section of the book moves out into the to the broader. These are huge generalizations. I'm not as organized as I'm making it sound, um, but moves out to the broader human world. And again, um, thinking about what <laughs> perishes and what might persist about us, uh, for better or for worse. Um, so this is a poem I wrote after uh, we were in Madrid and we saw. Picasso's uh, painting, uh, Guernica, and I know you all know the, yeah. the imagery in it, um, but what I didn't know until I saw it is that it's gigantic. It, it takes a whole wall, and so it's very different from seeing it printed on your mug or you know all the other places we put it. Uh, viewing Guernica in Madrid. Their kindergarten teacher could be telling them this imaginary horse was not in Picasso's early drawings. In the Spanish, I cannot understand. Maybe he says, once upon a market day in Guernica, the world collapsed around whole families whose luck ran out or did not from a burning building. Maybe he mentions German pilots high above the town who were imagining what would happen in that instant when they're dropped bombs stopped whistling, while down below a horse was incapable of imagining how to gallop out from under the sky's sudden piercing rain. When the teacher points to the wall behind him, his class wrapped, surely he explains they're lucky to sit cross-legged before a masterpiece, a painting people come from far away to see. And I, who am one of those people, look past the heads of tiny children to the painting that takes the whole wall and see it's not Picasso's wailing woman trailing into ghostliness, infant slack and cooling in her arms, and not the bull with its bayonet horns that makes this an object of devotion, but the horse's gaping terror the horse's tongue razor sharp by pain, the horse's leg severed and strewn, and most of all, its dumb, dying scream, still open to us decades later and so pure in black and white as animal terror can be pure, because a horse could never understand the human imagination. No matter how long you talk to it, how clear your diction and enthusiastic your voice. How careful and small your words. I wonder if their teacher's telling them Guernica <coughs> started out in color, but color would have added nothing. Mm. in an awful state, of course, um, and especially the world's children, and the United Nations documents this every single year with a report on the state of the world's children, um, which they collect their stories and, and compile their statistics. Um, so that inspired this poem, Report on the State of the World's Children. They took me to sea in a faulty raft. I couldn't swim, but dead I could float. I came from the wrong tribe. They took me at night over mountains and let go of my hand. I was born at the wrong time. They took me to a place of tents and snow. The heat was fire and they rationed the flames. Winter entered to sleep with us, also men harsher than winter. I was brave, only my dreams cried out. I came from the wrong village. They took me to a camp with tall fences, cholera could vault. I crossed from a wrong country, alone I wandered a desert. I slept under a cactus for weeks until crows found me. They took me to jail. I watched a green fly who was allowed to come and go. 
They pronounced my wrong name. I prayed the wrong way. They took my house and gave me rubble. Then they told me to go home. I sat day after day and made walls from all that I had. My two arms became mother and father, holding each other and hugging my knees. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. up with two uh, shorter poems. Um, this one begins with an, um, an epigraph uh, written by Dostoevsky in one of his novels. He wrote, later on, besides civic grief, he also began falling into champagne. <laughs> Weather forecast. Morning will buckle its marine layer, its predictable cloud belt. You'll try to sidle up to words, barefoot and in pajamas. Listening to Bach, you'll believe everything the cello says about regret. You'll read the news and adorn yourself with civic grief, that tattered bunting. Chances are good the cosmic gears will grind morning into afternoon before you notice. Some sun might just break the skin of fog. Your lover will come home. You'll roast a chicken and forget to be sad. The night will offer its wine-flavored promises. Mm. last one. All those were written before he should he who shall not be named. Oh. Um, mm. This one was written after. Uh, a friend asked me, where will you go when things get worse? And um, <laughs> of course things have gotten a lot worse since she asked me that. But uh, uh, this is what I came up with. Where will you go when things get worse? Surf keeps overwhelming the remains of a fishing boat beached and abandoned weeks ago, rubbing it to extinction wave by wave, plank by plank. I joke, this must be the ship of state, humor being a vehicle for escape. If you're an astronaut, you can seek another planet for atmosphere. If you're a wordsmith, you can keep hammering, or else stop and pour the single malt to shake you nightly off your axis. I watch sanderlings, tiny birds who feed on tides, somehow unscathed by pounding, and I imagine flight. But once launched, what Arctic would I land in that isn't melting? At my feet, red carcasses of crabs, a shell being another vehicle that will take you only so far. If you're a crab, you can swim or scuttle or hunker down on your unsettled patch of sand, all ten legs set to resist. She does have books here, and uh, talk to her about them during the break. We're going to take a quick break, during which time the camera will be turned off, so you don't have to worry about the CIA, FBI, 